We do welcome you this evening to our broadcast. We thank you very much for joining with us this evening and we pray that the Lord will join with us as well and be our portion as we come together in this fashion, as we sing his praises and as we come around his word. So wherever, wherever you're joining uh, with us from, we're very glad to have you as part of the audience this evening and we pray the Lord will speak to our hearts. 310 is our opening hymn, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb, Redeemed Through His Infinite Mercy, His Child and Forever I Am. 310, and the words will be there again on the screen for your benefit. <laughs> Let's now bow together in prayer and look to the Lord that he might bless us. Our God and Father, we bow this evening hour in thy presence in the name of our Redeemer. We thank thee for the great work of redemption. There is only one Redeemer, and that is our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
that he is the one who came to pay the price of redemption and give his own life, shed his own blood. And we thank the Lord that his life was given, a worthy life for an unworthy life. And we rejoice that there is redemption this night uh, through the blood. And we thank thee, O Lord, that that payment that was made at, at Calvary when Jesus Christ laid down his life was a payment to redeem and to ransom the souls of sinners. And we thank thee the debt was paid in full. O oh Lord, we could never pay any of the debt. Not this, the smallest fraction would we be able to pay. We thank thee for one who has paid in full. And tonight there is full redemption. O oh, full and free salvation. And Lord, we praise thee that there is a gospel to proclaim that there is a salvation to declare and to make known to men and women and to exhort them to come and to avail of this so great salvation. We thank thee for a Saviour who did indeed come into the world with that purpose of redeeming sinners. Lord, this was the goal. This was the purpose in leaving heaven and <coughs> setting aside that glory that there was with the Father and veiling himself in human flesh. It was that he might become the redeemer of sinners. And tonight we do want to magnify the one who is the redeemer. And as we have been singing in this hymn of personal redemption and being able to say, I am redeemed, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, we pray, Lord, that that would be the testimony of, of many, if not all, who are listening. Speak to those who know thee not and who have as yet never come to Christ. They've never looked upon the Savior in this way. They know of him, they've heard of him. His name may be familiar to them, but they've never come in faith to Christ. They've never looked upon him as a guilty sinner looking upon a Savior and looking with the eye of faith, looking away to one who will, will forgive and cleanse and wash and make them ready for heaven. And we pray tonight, O Lord, that some soul will indeed look on Christ in that way and they will see the beauty in him the beauty of the Redeemer, the beauty of the one who was the sacrifice for sin, there shedding his own blood. So, Lord, do bless, we pray, and undertake, we ask, as we continue on before thee this evening, bless us as uh, we are gathered, wherever we may be. Let us know the need of every heart, and uh, every need among us, Lord, is, is known to thee. We take comfort from that, O Lord, and we would ask thee, therefore, to... Uh, bless our souls and minister to us this evening as we're now before thee. For we pray in our Saviour's worthy name. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is just over a page there, 316. And it's a trembling soul I sought the Lord. My sin confessed, my guilt deplored. How soft and sweet his word to me. I took thy place and died for thee. 316. And the words will be there again for your benefit.
turning now to the Word of God. John's Gospel, chapter 4, is where we want to turn to this evening and read the Scriptures from. And we're going to read from the opening verse of this fourth chapter of John's Gospel. So John's Gospel, chapter 4, and we're reading from the opening verse. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, although Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this his disciples, upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And then if we <coughs> go down to verse 39 of the chapter, and we'll just read a few verses here. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him, for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. Amen. We'll end there at verse 42. We know the Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his word this evening to all of our hearts. We're going to bow together in prayer and ask the Lord for his help 
as we come to the Word of God, to come to this portion that we have been reading. Our Father, we do pray that Thou will bless Thy Word and give help to us as we come to consider it and consider this incident where the Saviour came to that well in that region of Samaria. And what a conversion took place in this woman's life and heart and in others as well. And we pray that, Lord, Thou will take Thy Word and write it upon our hearts, we pray, and we ask that it might be a saving word. Just as this woman was converted and brought to Christ and many others believed as well, we pray, Lord, that there will be those who will this night believe on Jesus Christ. O oh, draw them to thyself, we pray, and work in their lives. So abide with us, we ask. Give help as we preach. Lord, we all need help to hear. I need that added help to minister the word of God. Grant that to us now, we pray, as we are before thee, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There is a statement that you find in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 1. And it reads, I am found of them that sought me not. I am found of them that sought me not. And surely that is a very telling commentary upon what we have just read in this fourth chapter of John's Gospel. For here is an individual that the Lord sought. The woman did not come seeking the Lord. She did not know he was there. She did not even know who he was when she did come out to the well. But rather the Lord Jesus had indeed come seeking her. And that truth that you have there in Isaiah 65 and verse 1, I am found of them that sought me not, has been frequently verified among the teeming masses of humanity. The saving blessings of the gospel are, are unmerited. There's not a single individual who merits any blessing from God. And oftentimes, many of those individuals experience those blessings and have them conferred upon them, unsought. There are certainly individuals, we read of them in the Gospels, who came to seek the Lord Jesus while he was here on earth. The Lord had worked in them and he was drawing them unto himself. They would not have come any other way. They certainly would not have come of themselves. But we, we read of them coming. For example, Nicodemus in, in the previous chapter here is the most obvious individual. So well known who came to the Lord by night. But that was the very point. He came to the Lord. He came seeking the Lord. But here in chapter 4... The circumstances are altogether different. Here is an individual who does not know who it is that is speaking to her at the well. She just thinks he's an ordinary individual. She marvels that, that somebody being a Jew would ever enter into a conversation with her. But she just thinks of him as an ordinary individual. She did not realize that the Son of God had come to seek her. And she was... She was indeed going to find him as her saviour. And those words are going to come to pass to be true. I am found of them that sought me not. The Lord once said to his disciples, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. When they were going about their fishing, when they were careless and indifferent about him and about the matter of salvation, he came seeking them too. How many times do we not read here in the Gospels where he came to them and he said, follow me. Oh, he aroused their attention. He poured light into their darkened souls and minds. He opened their understanding that they might believe the Gospel. And he saved them and then he called them to follow him. And he was right when he said, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Well, this woman of Samaria is another example in kind of that very same truth. The Lord has come to seek and to save her soul. He's come to speak to her about the living water. She had come out to the well to, to draw ordinary water. She had come out uh, to draw water at, at noonday with even a sense of shame. That's what brought her this time of the day because she had a sense of, of shame as to her, her manner of living. So she's a, a virtual outcast and she comes out at the very hottest part of the day. Little did she know that she was going to find more than just physical water. Because here in verse 
13 and 14 of this chapter, the Lord Jesus said, Whoso drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of springing water, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So the Lord Jesus began to speak to her about living water. Something more than just the physical water. Something that is in your soul. Something that satisfies the deepest need and the deepest longing of your soul. Is it any surprise that in the midst of this conversation, you read there in verse 15 that this woman said, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Sir, give me this water. Oh, there was a desire wrought in her heart for this life-giving water. And that's certainly our prayer and desire this evening, that some individual that the Lord would so work this evening in your heart. If you're unsaved and unconverted, that the Lord would work a desire into your heart that you would desire this life-giving water. That you would even be like this woman of Samaria and, and utter these very same words that you have here in verse 15 of this chapter. Sir, Give me this water. Oh, may you desire the life-giving water of the gospel, that which will satisfy your soul, that which will satisfy the thirst of your soul, that which will bring to you all the blessings of the gospel. And we want to consider her this evening and her conversion. We want to add her to that uh, group of individuals we have been seeking to consider of late, Individuals who were strangers to the promises, aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, outside the company of the, the physical people of God. They weren't born children of Israel. They weren't born descendants of, of Jacob. But they were those who were, who were brought in, nevertheless, to the experience of the gospel. And we can add this woman of Samaria to that, that company. Now the first thing that I want you to consider here is the Saviour's determination to meet this woman. The Saviour's determination to meet this woman. And that takes us back to verse 4 of this chapter where it says he must needs go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. Now from the earlier verses there in the chapter, it's clear that he needed to leave Judea. But he didn't have to go through Samaria his ministry was attracting the disquiet of the Jewish rulers and our Lord and Saviour being aware of this and knowing that his hour had not yet come, he left that dis district of his own accord and he's going to travel back to Galilee. Verse 3 tells us he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So he's going to make this, this journey from, from the southern part of the land of Israel to the northern part of the land of Israel. But the common way of doing this was not to go through Samaria. Samaria lay in the middle. Samaria cut off the northern part of the land of Israel from the southern part. And you had Galilee in the north and Judea in the south. And then in the middle, stretching from the Mediterranean Sea to the River Jordan, you had that region of Samaria. But the common practice was not to travel up through Samaria. The common practice among the Jews was to cross over Jordan and, cross and travel up the eastern side of the River Jordan, up through what was known as the region of Perea, and then having got beyond the region of Samaria, to cross over the Jordan again into Galilee and continue on in your journey. Such was the, the dislike of the Samaritans. Such was the, the, the truth that even this woman acknowledged here when she said that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This is, this is how far it went. They wouldn't even travel through the region of Samaria. But how different it is with the Lord Jesus. It tells us here he must needs go through Samaria. Not, not in a, a physical necessity. Not in the necessity in the sense that he's traveling from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north. And therefore in order to do that you, you would have to pass through Samaria. That's not the necessity that is mentioned here. Because as I've explained what they would have done. The common practice was to cross over Jordan and go up the eastern side and cross back. Now there's a different type of necessity here that is laid upon the Saviour. It's a spiritual necessity. 
It's a necessity that has to do with the saving of this woman's soul. It has to do with her spiritual well-being, her spiritual destiny. That's what the necessity lies around. That's why it says here in verse 4, he must needs go through Samaria. And does that not underscore this evening the necessity that there is for men and women to consider and seek Jesus Christ? As the Lord Jesus had said to to Nicodemus in the previous chapter, ye must be born again. Oh, there was a necessity there in that conversation when the Lord was speaking to that ruler among the Jews. Ye must be born again. There's a necessity to be born again. And here's this necessity brought out again when we come into chapter 4 and we're thinking about this woman of Samaria. The Saviour must needs go through Samaria because here is a woman that he's going to meet with. Here is a soul that needs to be saved. And my friend, may the Lord indeed press upon your heart this evening the necessity of getting right with God. The necessity of seeking Christ. The necessity of uttering these words in verse 15 that we have already drawn to your attention when this woman said, Sir, give me this water. There's a necessity here. It has to do with your eternal well-being. It has to do with your eternal destiny. And may that necessity be pressed upon you this evening. That is not something that you can dismiss and set aside and neglect for a moment longer. And maybe the case is that you have neglected this for many a time. But may the Lord so impress his word upon your heart this evening that you will come to that place where you will feel this necessity in your own soul. Not just others who feel the necessity for you, but that that you will feel the necessity for yourself. She was the most unlikely individual ever to be saved. Ever to be converted and brought to know Jesus Christ. And I say that because of this great animosity that there was between the Jews and the Samaritans. There was a long history. A long history that had created an enormous prejudice that had led to burning resentment. The Jewish estimation of the Samaritans can be easily seen when you consider that there was no worse insult for the Jewish leaders to level at the Saviour than to call him a Samaritan. Turn over to John chapter 8 and verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. Well, that phrase, that Statement just gives you a little insight into what the Jews thought about the Samaritans. Now this woman has already said there in verse 9 that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. But it went much deeper than that. They they certainly avoided them and we have explained there how they would have avoided them by even not travelling through uh, the region in which they lived. But there was a burning resentment against them. And that's why they used that term against the Saviour, thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. Because they could think of no worse insult to cast against the Saviour than to call him a Samaritan. They had so low views of this people. Now the Samaritans were those who had colonized this particular area of the land of Israel. They had been brought there from uh, the east by the king of Assyria at the time, just after the time of the captivity of the, of the northern kingdom and the ten tribes going into captivity. The king of Assyria brought them there because he wanted to dilute the strength of feeling and the numbers of those who would be opposed uh, to him. So therefore he, he brings in this other people who, who would have no allegiance at all to the land and who would, who would be looked upon with suspicion by those that were left behind. And over time the, those people who were brought there intermingled with the few remaining inhabitants of the land. They developed a strange medley of religion mixing together the principles and rites of Judaism with their own oriental superstitions and idolatries. They had a religion all of their own and was a a hybrid religion. It was a, a mixture of many things. And therefore they were looked upon 
with suspicion and with prejudice. In later years, some of the upper class Jews, discontented with their own laws and government, joined with the Samaritans. And prior to the New Testament era, they had built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, which is just either side of the, the city of, of Sychar. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are two mountains that are mentioned in the Bible. These mountains lay either side of this particular city and there was a rival temple built upon Mount Gerizim. That's what the woman is referring to there in verse 20 where she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Because there was a temple built on Mount Gerizim and there was worship that went on there. So for all of these reasons and more, there was great prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans, virtually living separate one from the other. As I say, she seemed the most unlikely of individuals ever to be converted, and yet yet we find the Lord Jesus Christ having an interest in her soul and in her spiritual well-being. Yet we find here a necessity on the life of the Lord Jesus in his heart and soul where it says he must needs go through Samaria. And he did so with great personal cost. He's traveling in the heat of the day in order to come to this well at this very hour. He's weary. He's weary. <coughs> Verse 6 says, And now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour. Well the sixth hour is noonday. As the Jews begin their day at 6 a.m. So the sixth hour is going to be noon. And you imagine the, the heat that there would be the blazing sun beating down upon the traveller. It's little wonder anyone would be weary. Especially having travelled and maybe travelled a number of miles in order to get to this very place. But the Lord Jesus is doing all of this for one particular reason. And the exhaustion and the weariness that he is feeling physically is so that he may come to the well at this very hour when this woman would come forth to draw water. Does that not remind us of the great personal cost? That Jesus Christ was willing to pay in order to save sinners. Oh, far more than just being wearied. We know that Jesus Christ was willing to give his very life. He came into this world willing to die at the cross and shed his precious blood in order that souls might be saved. That's absolutely necessary. In order for a soul to be saved, in order for there to be living water to partake of, Jesus Christ had to give his life. There's a necessity placed upon him in that regard. And when you think of him being wearied with the journey, do you remember those cries that came from the cross and that one? Just one word, actually, that came from his lips at that particular time. He said, I thirst. Might be two words in our language, but just one in the language that the Saviour would have spoken, I thirst. Oh, what personal cost there was to Christ in order to provide salvation for sinners. My friend, may we indeed feel that necessity and see something of that cost in Christ. And may we be like this woman and desire this living water. So you have the Saviour's determination. I want you to think, secondly, of the Saviour's discourse with this woman. Because he entered into a conversation with her which was remarkable as well. So remarkable that this woman even mentions it, that he would have any dealings with her. So he comes into this region of Samaria. He comes to this city that is called Sychar. The name of it is given there in verse 5. Now Sychar is the same as Shechem in the Bible. And we can easily... Uh, 
make that connection because of what else we are told in verse 5. Because it says, which is Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, without going back into um, Genesis and looking at some of these places, you can look it up yourself, Genesis chapter uh, 33 and Genesis chapter 48. You will find reference there to that piece of ground that Jacob purchased and then that, that ground that he gave to his son Joseph. But it will tell you back there that it was at Shechem. In fact, you can actually go to the same place in the land of Israel uh, this very hour. There's a place where they mark out this parcel of ground and the well and so on. Joseph was buried in this parcel of ground. If you go back to the book of Joshua, as I say, we're not going to take time to do that uh, this evening, but... I certainly would encourage you to look up those verses and, and just consider them for uh, your own benefit. Jake, uh, Joseph was buried in this parcel of ground. Joseph was not buried with the patriarchs in the cave of Mel uh, Machpelah, which was down in Hebron, which was down in the southern part, down below Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem. Joseph was buried up here in Shechem, in this parcel of ground. But the name of the city here is called Sychar. Today in, in the land of Israel, it's, it's the city of Nablus. It's in the West Bank, in the land of Israel. It's, it's the chief city of the northern part of the West Bank. Hebron is the, the chief city of the southern part of the West Bank. But we're thinking about the northern part and the chief city there. Even to this day, it's a stronghold of the Palestinians who are bitterly opposed to Israel. Some things never change. There's this animosity that is here in John chapter 4 between the Jews and the Samaritans. Even to this day, there's that animosity that there is between the Palestinians and, and the Jews. But the Saviour comes to this very place, to this city and to a well outside this city. Jacob's well as it is called here. The disciples go into the town in order to obtain some provisions. And this gives the Saviour the opportunity then to converse with this woman. Because she comes out to draw water. The Saviour knew that this was the time of the day in which she would come out. She's there because of a sense of shame. She's there because of her sinful lifestyle. She's an outcast. She's ostracized by those evidently in the, in the city, at least by many in, in, in the city because of her sinful way of, of living. And here she comes at the very hottest part of the day in order to draw water. Usually it would be the morning, in the early hours or in the evening time when it was much cooler that water would be drawn from the well and carried because that was a wearying exercise in itself. So therefore, you wouldn't go out in the hottest part of the day to do this. But this woman is here, and the Lord knows all about her. And he knows at this very time that this is when she will be at the well, and he will have the opportunity of speaking to her. And as she comes, he's going to enter into conversation with her. And the first thing that he does is that he melts away that animosity that there is in her heart. If there's any sense of, of prejudice, if there's any feeling that the Jews have no dealings with her and, and here is an individual who'll just be like all the other Jews and they'll want nothing to do with her. He melts away that animosity by simply asking there in verse 7, Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Give me to drink. That immediately made an impression upon this woman because we read in verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This woman believed that up until that moment, she believed that he was just going to deal with her as the Jews would deal with any Samaritan. Have nothing to do with them at all. But asking that one question, give me to drink. Or requesting, it's not so much a question, it's, 
It's a request. Give me to drink. The Lord Jesus is going to melt away all that animosity and all that sense of prejudice that there is that has built up for years. And what a melting of heart there took, there took place. That same melting of heart needs to take place in every life. Oh, whatever prejudices and, and animosity there might be against the gospel and against Jesus Christ that is in the heart of an unsaved soul, it needs to be melted away. And may the Lord, by his mercy and by his grace, even do that this evening in your heart if you're unconverted. Whatever the excuses are, whatever the objections are, whatever it is you're hiding behind and, and using as a reason for not coming to know Jesus Christ, may all of that be taken out of the way this evening. And may there be a melting of your heart, just as there was a melting of this heart of this woman of Samaria. Now it is evident that this woman, in her conversation with the Lord Jesus, needed more than just physical water. Her, her sinful lifestyle did not satisfy her. They may have provided her, her sinful ways of living may have provided her with a, a comfortable life of sorts, but it certainly did not provide her with satisfaction. She's there as a thirsting soul. Not only is she there needing physical water to satisfy the physical thirst of the human body, but she's also there as a thirsting soul. That's evident from her speech. And her speech betrays her heart and betrays her real feelings. Was not what the little damsel said to Peter when Peter spoke? She said, it is your speech that betrays you. It's your speech that marks you out as being with Jesus Christ, for you're a Galilean as well, and you speak like a Galilean. Well, here's a woman, and her speech betrays her. Her speech reveals to us just what is in our heart and soul. Because as soon as the Savior speaks of living water, she desires it. She desires it. Verses 13 and 14, you have the Savior speaking about the living water. We've quoted them already. And then in verse 15, you have her reply. Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. Surely that statement on her part indicates that there is a thirst in her soul that has not been satisfied. If she was content with her lot in life and satisfied with her sinful pleasures... Do you think that she would be asking the Lord for this water? That she would be bothered? That she would be interested in having a conversation with him at all about this living water? If she was being satisfied by the pleasures of the world? Does it not indicate to us that there is a thirst in her soul? And whatever pleasures she might pursue in this world, they're never going to bring any satisfaction to her. My friend, you can pursue the pleasures of the world, but they'll never satisfy. They'll never satisfy your soul. The pleasures of sin only last for a season, the Bible tells us, and a very short season of that. They only last for a season. There's a thirst, and only Christ can satisfy that thirst. For he is the one who is spoken of here. He's speaking of himself. When he says here about the, the water, that whoso drinketh shall never thirst again. Verse 14, whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up. Springing up into everlasting life. Oh, the Lord Jesus is here speaking about himself and speaking about the gospel the saving grace of God. The best way we can put it is to take the words of Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. 
And here's Christ speaking about the water from the well of salvation. That's what satisfies the soul. That's what will satisfy your soul this evening. Nothing else ever will. You need to come and drink of this water. You need to have this attitude of this woman. Sir, give me this water. And the water that she was speaking about is the water out of the well of salvation. And you'll never be satisfied until you come and until you drink out of this well. And may you come even this evening. May the Lord break down that prejudice and opposition that there is in your heart and bring you to the place where you will desire to drink out of the well of salvation. May you be like this woman. May the Lord so speak to you this evening, individually and personally, that you will end with the same desire as this woman had. There's one final thing I want us to consider here, and that's the Savior's discernment of this woman. Because it was this discernment of her and her uh, circumstances in life that convinced her that he was indeed the Messiah and led her to believe on him and also to go and testify to others that she had found the Messiah. It was this discernment because she soon realized that she was uh, in conversation with no ordinary individual. Because in verse 19, she said, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And that come in the wake of the Lord laying bare her past life and her present life. And the sinfulness of it. She realized she was in the presence of someone who knew everything about her. And as a result, she says, I perceive thou art a prophet. Her perception is totally changing. Remember, she started out thinking he's just an ordinary Jew with all his prejudices. She's surprised when he asks for a drink of water. Why would you ask me when the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Her whole perspective now is changing with regards to this individual that she is engaged in conversation with. And what will bring her not only to understand that he is no ordinary individual, but to understand that he is no less than the Messiah himself is the fact that he's going to lay bare her sins. He's going to show her her own heart. He's going to touch upon her sins. Many times, many places, there's a gospel preached, even preached in places this evening that never touches on sin, that avoids sin. There is a gospel that is pre uh, preached in a Christ that is presented to men and women and it's got nothing to do with sinfulness. But the Lord Jesus touched upon this woman's sins. He put his finger right upon it and she felt it and felt it keenly. And it was that touch of, her, of the Saviour upon her with regards to her sins that made her sense her sinfulness and brought her to the place of believing. You see, in the gospel there has to be a conviction of sin. If there's ever going to be a real, true, genuine drinking of the wells of salvation, then there has to be conviction of sin. And this woman came under conviction of sin. She was honest. She was honest because the Lord said to her in verse 16, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In this sayest thou truly. Well, she's honest. She's not trying to hide her life and her lifestyle, her sins. The Lord has this effect upon her that, that there's, there's an honesty, there is a, a confession here. Isn't that what is needed in, in every heart in life is, is judgment day honesty? A facing up to reality, a facing up to our own sinfulness before God and a realization that we do indeed need a saviour. And may that indeed happen in our lives. May the Lord so touch us, not only speak to us, but may the Lord touch our heart in such a fashion that we come under conviction of sin. And there's no hiding. 
There's no excusing of sin. And as a result, this woman soon believed on him. She knew of a coming Messiah. She tells us that in verses 25 and, and uh, verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. So she knew that, that a Messiah was to come, but the Saviour tells her, I am he. Verse 26 I that speak unto thee am he. Now she has come <coughs> to the very critical moment. What is she going to do with Jesus Christ? And she believed on him to the saving of her soul. She wants the water, remember? There's a thirst in her soul and she's already said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. And she drank of that life-giving water. There and then, as Christ is revealed unto her as the Messiah, she drank of those from those wells of salvation. And into her soul there came that, that water, as the Saviour described it there in verse 14, the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's what she partook of. She came to believe and she came to confess him to others for she forgot the purpose for which she had come. She leaves her water pot, we are told. And she, verse 28, and she went into the city and she spoke to the men who knew her and she said to them, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Oh, she has believed. And now she's confessing the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And she's inviting others, come see a man who told me all things ever I did. It was not the point that we made there just a, a moment or two ago that it was this that, that struck her heart, that the Lord knew all about her. My friend, the Lord knows all about you tonight. He knows every sin you've committed. But he's also a saviour. And he's willing to cleanse and he's willing to forgive and he's willing to give you the life-giving water of salvation. As a result, many did believe, many others. When you look at verse 39 and verse 41, both of those verses tell us that there were others who believed. So not only did she believe, but she had an influence upon others. And it finishes off there in verse 42 with this declaration that Christ is the Savior of the world. And that term is used in the sense that he is more than the Savior of the Jews. He's the Savior of the Jew and the Gentile. That's what that term means. It appears in, in 1 John as well, where John, writing in his epistle, speaks about the Savior of the world. But that's what it means. Oh, no longer was he being viewed just as the Savior among the Jews. He's the Savior of the world. And my friend, he's, he's the saviour of the world tonight. And he's able to save you. And may he save you. May you say as this woman did, Sir, give me this water. And it's not a church you need to come to or a preacher you need to come to. It's Jesus Christ. And may you call upon him even this very night and be saved. Oh, I trust the Lord will bless his word. Write it upon your heart. Make it a saving word in some heart this very evening. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we pray that thou will bless thy word. Oh, may some soul this night come to know thee as the Savior of the world. And they may experience what it is to drink that life-giving supply from the wells of salvation. Oh, may that be so. Bless thy word we ask of thee. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is 235. On the happy golden shore where the faithful part no more. When the storms of life are o'er, meet me there. Where the night dissolves away into pure and perfect day. I am going home to stay. Meet me there. And we can only meet there if we come to know the Saviour. And may he indeed do that. 235. 
and the words will appear there on the screen for you. I trust the Lord will bless his word to your heart this evening. And if you do want to contact us, there will be contact details on the, the screen. Feel free to do that. May the Lord bless.